we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you all here. Awesome. Can everybody see that? Can I get a thumbs up? We good? Awesome. I see some thumbs up. Okay. So um, today what we're going to be talking about is um, how to use psychology to, to really drive sustainable behavior. Actually, let me X out here real quick. There we go. How do you use psychology to drive um, sustainable behavior change? So what this really means is like how, what sort of tips and tricks can we use in the sustainability field to ultimately try to get people to do what we want them to do? So things like how to recycle or encouraging them to recycle or get to turn their lights off before they leave the room or use alternative transportation. But these sorts of um, tactics can be used outside of sustainability too. So just this morning, uh, we were talking to staff, it's like, you know, these sorts of tactics could be used to encourage people to stay home uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so think about this outside of sustainability too, but that's kind of going to be the focus of these today. So here's uh, an outline of what we're going to go through today. We're going to go through just a really quick uh, overview of some behavior strategies or kind of two big ones. And we're going to talk about the difference between those and then jump into the one um, that tends to be most effective. We'll identify um, some benefits and barriers. Um, that is actually one of the biggest first steps we have to take in order to determine what strategies will work the best to get people to act in a manner that is sustainable how to develop those strategies, knowing the barriers and the benefits. And then also I have a resources slide for you all. So if you're interested in this, you can read more about it. Uh, we're also recording this webinar, so we'll be sure to share this information out with you all um, as we move along and um, also provide some additional resources as follow up. Okay, so let's get into it here. Introduction to behavior strategies. So um, one of the first things I want to start with here is a little interactive uh, poll here. And if I can pull up my, here we go. I have a poll that I want to have you guys answer for me here. And it's this question right here. So you all can just reply uh, using uh, the, the graphic that's displayed. Why do people not make sustainable choices? Uh, so I guess you can pick really as many as you want, uh, but if you could pick maybe the top two or three in your mind, that might be the most appropriate for this conversation. So why do people not make sustainable choices? So I'll give you just a couple seconds to kind of provide some feedback here. And then I'll, sh I'll try to share the results out uh, after folks have had a chance to respond. All right, we've got about 65% of you who have responded. Oh, 70. Give another five seconds here. All right, so I'm gonna uh, show you guys, I'm gonna share the results here. So here is what you all kind of uh, gave feedback on as far as why people don't make sustainable choices. The number one being that it's easy to default to known behaviors, right? The behaviors that we maybe grew up with or that have kind of been a part of our cultural norm or the, our, our social, social construct, those are the ones that we tend to default to. Then the second one looks like sustainable choices aren't convenient, right? That can often be a barrier to folks um, engaging in, or choosing to engage or not engage in a sustainable behavior. So you guys picked two really big ones. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing this real quick and go back to my screen. Awesome. So good, that's a really great primer to start the conversation. Um, so what we're gonna do next is continue on this thread. So the first thing I wanna start with is um, how do we get people to make sustainable choices? And there are two different thought processes or two different kind of ideas and philosophy behind how you can get people to change their behavior. One is what's called an information-based strategy. So within the information-based strategies, there are two different sub-approaches within that umbrella uh, idea. One is called the attitude behavior approach and the other one is called the economic self-interest approach. And with the attitude behavior approach, this idea basically says that we can get people to change their behavior if only they knew enough, right? If only they had the education, if they were provided the correct information, if that was met, 
then they would change their behavior. So that's the, kind of the, the thought behind that one. The economic self-interest approach says that, hey, people tend to act in accordance with their personal interests. So if you tell somebody, you know, something like how much money they might save or what sort of personal gain they may have by doing something, that individual will maximize that information and actually change their behavior based on then knowing that. So that's, those two ideas are, fall under the information-based strategy. So knowing the information-based strategy is basically is education and telling people that if they save money or stand to uh, have some sort of personal benefit from acting in, in the manner that you want, those are the two ideas. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, does this strategy work? The strategy of education and or providing financial information. Um, and oftentimes being in the sustainability space for a while, we hear a lot, well, all we have to do is educate people. If they only knew, then they would make the right decision. Or if only we could tell them, you know, how much benefit or how much cost they might save or how much, uh, how much money they might make off of doing something, that's when they would uh, go ahead and make that sustainable behavior. But what's interesting is that largely when you use those two things by themselves, just educating people or just telling them how much they might stand to gain from a certain behavior, they, it doesn't actually make a difference. The education, just, just sharing information really won't do anything. It won't move the needle. There have actually been quite a few studies that have documented this to actually be the case. Uh, two examples specifically, um, there was a study that was done where they uh, brought in people for a case study and they, the people didn't know that they were being tested, but they brought in 500 people and they taught them all about littering, what the issues worth, what the issues with littering were, how it might be a blight to their community, things they could do to get involved. So they educated them on the issue. And then what they did is as people left the site, they staged litter just outside the front door of the building. And they found that even though in the building, 94% of people said, yeah, litter's an issue, we understand it's a problem and there's something that I should do about it. When they actually left the building, only 2% of people actually picked up the litter. So by giving people the information, it didn't, wasn't enough to adequately change their behavior. Uh, there's another example in California where there were households who were given, um, there, it was a 10-week study where they were given information on water savings and water efficiency. It outlined all the benefits of it, how much money they might save. But despite like all the time and effort spent on that, it was actually found to have no impact on water consumption in the state. So these are two hurdles that as sustainability professionals, we have to overcome these because oftentimes we want to default to, you know, educating people, but that's just not enough. So if not information, then what, right? What is the magic bullet? Or in this case, it's magic bullets, multiple. Um, the information that I'm gonna to cover today uh, or is from a book called Fostering Sustainable Behavior. Um, it's a really great book. You can actually read it for free online at cbsm.com. All you have to do is create a free account and you can read it. Um, or you can buy the book uh, on Amazon or wherever your, your favorite local bookstore is. But the alternative to the information-based approach is what's called CBSM or community-based social marketing. And I know that's a little bit of like weird naming, at least when I first heard about it, it kind of struck me as like a social media strategy or some community engagement strategy, but it's not really about that. Um, here off to the left of the slide are the six steps uh, that we have to take in order to get people to change their behavior. So the first step is that we have to select the behavior that we want to promote, right? So what do we want people to do? We first have to nail that down. Then we have to identify the barriers and the benefits to that behavior. And we're gonna spend a couple minutes talking about that stage specifically. Like what does that entail? Identifying barriers and benefits, what does that mean? Once we know those barriers and benefits, we have to design a strategy using uh, specific tools, and we'll go over what those tools are to drive those barriers and benefits the direction that we want. Then once you have that strategy, you can then pilot it, evaluate the impact, and then decide whether it's worth implementing broadly. But just know that the two steps we're gonna spend most of our time on today are the identif identification of barriers and benefits, as well as designing strategy using the tools. But again, this book is free. You can go read it online. In the class that I teach, I just give my students the website and they can log on and read it for free so they don't have to buy the book. So the first thing we're gonna start with is identifying barriers and benefits. 
really, this is kind of the crux of um, understanding whether, un first of all, understanding your problem, but then also deciding what's the best way to go forward once you know what your problem is. So how do we identify what barriers and benefits are? So the first thing we have to do is step back. And again, that first question is what's the behavior that I want to promote? So you might think, oh, I want to try to get people to recycle more, or I want to decrease the amount of food waste that people are generating. That's the behavior. Once you have identified that behavior, then you have to move on to the research stage of identifying the barriers and the benefits of that behavior. So there are some good places where you can get data. Uh, there are actually quite a lot of literature reviews, like published studies around a lot of these behaviors and sustainability. I know like the number of psychology studies on recycling is like in the hundreds. Uh, it's, it's kind of insane how much research has been done to try to figure out what's going up here in somebody's head when they have that one second at the bin to decide what to sort. So literature review, you can also do observations, field observations, which we have had students on campus do. They will literally sit at a bin and watch how people interact uh, with the bins to understand, okay, maybe we need to change the design based on how people are acting. Focus groups where you might be able to get a little bit more information. And then survey research. Um, literature reviews are a really low barrier way or low barrier place to start because it doesn't necessarily require that you go out and talk to people or set up all these groups. Another thing to know is that barriers can be internal or external barriers, and you need to try to understand both of those. So an, an internal barrier may be somebody's attitudes towards something, their preconceived notion about something. So oftentimes we hear, especially around recycling, oh, it's just going to all end up in the landfill anyway. Okay, well, that's an internal barrier to somebody that we have to understand uh, in order to get them to change their behavior. Or barriers may be external, as in something like as a university that we might have the ability to influence. Maybe our infrastructure isn't set up right. Maybe signage is inadequate. Maybe our reminders aren't in the right spot. So we have to be able to separate these two, the internal and the exterior barriers, and understand both of those. Another thing is that barriers are not a one-size-fits-all barrier. Um, they can vary by age, by gender, by socioeconomic status, by uh, income. So if you're trying to develop a solution that works universally, that means you have to understand all the barriers and benefits to everyone in that population, or at least as many people as possible. Uh, an example of this is what I have on the screen is that women are, most like, are more likely to identify personal safety as a barrier or a reason why they won't take public transportation over men. So if you hadn't talked to the women about it, you might build a public transportation system that's fantastic, but not address the personal safety issue. And also know that barriers to one sustainable behavior are not necessarily barriers to another, right? So just like barriers vary by all these demographic variables, barriers also vary based on the behavior that you want. So just, you gotta take the time to kind of, uh, kind of pick apart uh, where these barriers are. So what I did was I kind of put together an example of how you might use uh, this specific graphic actually um, to help you un better understand your barriers and your benefits to then be able to move forward with your strategy. So once you have identified your barriers and your benefits, that information then has to be central to you developing your solutions for them. Um, so here on the left, uh, I just picked an example of a behavior that you might want to encourage. So that's commuting via mass transit, or you could even get broader than that and say commuting via not single occupancy vehicle, right? Just using alternative transportation in general. And the be behavior that you want to discourage then is the opposite of that, right? We want to discourage commuting via single occupancy vehicles. So for the behavior we want to encourage commuting via mass transit or just using alternative transportation, what are some of the benefits? Well, you might save some cash, right? It's typically a little bit cheaper. You don't have to buy a car, you don't have all the maintenance. You're gonna avoid the traffic, so time. Um, you might be able to work while you're commuting, so productivity might be a benefit. But what are some of the barriers to that? So some barriers may be safety, maybe convenience, right? Maybe the closest bus stop is way too far away for you. Um, maybe you can't make it work with your schedule, right? Maybe the bus doesn't come when you need it, and maybe you've got kids and you gotta jump back and forth, so it just doesn't work with your life. That might be some of the barriers. Versus for the behavior that we want to discourage, well, what are some of the benefits? Obviously, a lot of people travel by single occupancy vehicle. There is a reason for that, right? So what are the benefits of that? Convenience is a big one, right? I can get wherever I want to go whenever I want to be there. Um, I can follow my own schedule. 
It's relatively safe, right? Depends on what sort of transportation you're uh, comparing it against. But what are some of the barriers or kind of what are some of those pain points of driving via a single occupancy vehicle? At least if you're in a downtown area, finding parking, right? That's always gonna be a pinch point. Uh, having to deal with traffic, right? How much time are you gonna sit on the highway waiting to get where you wanna go? But then also another barrier is that it's high cost, right? Not necessarily everyone wants to eat the cost of, of having their own personal vehicle. So that sort of activity that we just went through, you would do on a much larger scale for whatever behavior you're interested in driving. And you would kind of try to dive even further into that and identify barriers by those different demographics or by that different behavior. Once you know that, you can then use this chart on the right to uh, start figuring out what direction you need to move things in. So what I'm gonna do in the next slide is I've actually filled in this chart with uh, how it might look. Um, so for example, the behavior that we want to encourage there is commuting via tr mass transit, and the behavior that we want to discourage is commuting via single occupancy vehicles. Then you'll see the next column says barriers, and for the behavior that you want to encourage, you are going to want to discur or decrease the barriers for that particular behavior, while also increasing the benefits of that particular behavior, right? So you wanna do both of these at the same time. Decrease the barriers, increase the benefits. On the flip side, if we look at the behavior that we want to discourage, we're gonna do the opposite. We want to increase the barriers and decrease the benefits. Um, now, not all the time can you do all four of these at the same time. Um, in an ideal world, that's what I would try to aim for, is like, I wanna do all four of these at the same time. Uh, I wanna check all four of those boxes for barriers and benefits for both behaviors. Um, but if you can get as close to four as possible, that's great, right? So three is better than two, two is better than one. Uh, but you're gonna get the most effective strategy if you're able to check all four of those boxes. So here at IEPY, uh, everyone knows parking can be a little bit of a pain. Um, so, but from a sustainability standpoint, the more of a hassle finding parking is on campus, well, what does that do? It checks that box on increasing the bar barrier for the behavior that I want to discourage. So I don't mind from a sustainability standpoint that parking might be hard to find because that's a barrier. Um, so that's just one example. So this sort of mental game is what you'll play ideally when you're trying to figure out what's the best strategy to get people to do what you want to do and you just plug in your behaviors and your barriers and benefits uh, as appropriate. So after you've gone through this little mental exercise, and again, you want to try to do as many of these as possible, right? Three is better than four, three is, or, you know, four is better than three, three is better than two. Now that you know that, you're going to move on to the next step, which is developing your actual strategy. Um, and in the book, uh, Community-Based Social Marketing, there are seven tools that they explore uh, that have been to that have, they have found to be psychologically effective at getting people to change their behavior, right? We already established that education alone, just telling people how much money they might save or their benefits isn't gonna cut it, right? We gotta do something else in addition to that. And these are the seven tools, commitment, social norms, social diffusion, prompts, communication, incentive, and convenience. And we're gonna walk through each of these and I'll hopefully provide some examples to you as we're doing this. So while we're working through this, I would like for you all to play along at home. Um, and not necessarily, just not necessarily thinking out loud, but just think inside your head, okay, if this is the behavior that I'm trying to encourage, how might I use a prompt to help me do that? Or how might I use social diffusion to help me do that? So I just threw together some examples of behaviors that you might want to uh, change. Um, but if you have an example that you yourself have been wanting to change, I would adopt that one too, right? So you can pick one of these or pick your own. Uh, but just kind of keep track of it in your head and let's see if we can come up with some holistic strategy as we go through this. Okay, so commitment is one of the first of the seven strategies that uh, psychologists have found to be effective at getting people to change their behavior. Um, and really what it is, is it sets up people to make a much bigger change later. Um, so commitments can be written, can be oral, can be done as, in, as an individual, as in groups, and actually the e efficacy of that commitment depends on the setting in which it's made. Um, for example, uh, when individuals make a smaller commitment to something, they're much more likely to then behave that way later on down the road. Um, psychologists have also found that written commitments, commitments that are actually written down, 
versus said uh, tend to be more effective. And it also tends to be more effective if it is done publicly and in groups, and especially if that group is a group of folks that you consider to be friends or colleagues or somebody that you know uh, versus a group of strangers. And the reason why commitments can be effective is because um, it's an important character trait that people are trustworthy or at least perceived as trustworthy. So if I make a commitment to do something, if that commitment is written and it's public and other people saw me make it, well, then they might think that maybe I'm going back on something that I said if I don't do it later. So we're, we're kind of leveraging um, people's desire to be reliable and trustworthy in, in this particular strategy that we can use. Um, so if you don't do that, you might be viewed as a person who's maybe of less integrity or something like that. Um, an example of this is here at IEPY, we have the IEPY Energy Challenge, which is a three-week competition where we get uh, the campus to compete against each other to see who can reduce build, uh, energy usage in their building over a three-week period of time. Associated with that is the energy challenge commitment, where we have folks go through and fill out, hey, I'm going to agree to do all of these behaviors over this three-week period, and they sign up for that, they get that email back to them, and then it lives on our website. So the commitment's also great because it also acts a little bit of an as an education tool because it explains to them all the things they could do and they get to pick whichever ones fit best for their lifestyle. The second tool is what's called uh, social norms. Um, social norming is this idea that we tend to act like the people who are closest to us. Um, and we can use that to our advantage. So if you think of, if you happen to recycle in your neighborhood, at least for me, I know if I go down to the end of the curb on recycle day and I look down the street and everybody else has the recycle bin out except for me, I might feel a little bit left out. Um, so we're going to try to use social norming to our advantage. Um, an example of this I here have here off to the right is hotels that have tried to encourage folks to reuse their bath towels instead of just um, throwing them on the floor and having them have to wash them after one use. And what they did is they created these three different signs, uh, just kind of hangers that they hung up in the bathroom next to the towel rack, and then assessed how many people actually decided to reuse their towel. And what it showed was the importance of language, but also how important that it was communicated as close to them. So for example, the first one was just some general message about the environment, nothing really descriptive about towels or reusing them. And about 37% of people reuse their towel just based on that simple message hanging up there. The next message says, hey, 75% of guests in this hotel usually use their towels more than once. Right? Would you consider doing that? Um, that number then jumped to 44% of people in that room reuse their towel, right? Because it became more personal to me, right? This hotel. And then finally, the last one they trialed was 75% of guests in this room, in the room that I'm staying in, use their towels more than once. And again, it jumped to almost 50%. So as the information got more personal to me, right, that I was able to see myself in the setting, that's when we were able to leverage social norming to get people to change their behavior. And all that was done was just putting that sign up there, but the information was specific to them. For social norms really to be effective, there are some, some things that we have to do as far as delivery to make sure that they work. One is that it needs to be presented at the time the behavior is to occur, ideally. So in this case, the sign was hung up right next to the bath towel. It might have been different if it was just hanging on the wall somewhere, on the door as you walked in, but it was right there at the point that somebody would decide to engage in that behavior or not. It needs to encourage good behavior instead of discouraging bad behavior. So this, in general, tends to be a theme uh, psychologically, especially in sustainability, is that positive framing works much better than negative framing. Um, because unfortunately, sometimes if you tell people, there's a sign that says, don't litter, well, then all you did was give somebody the idea that, hey, I can litter. I didn't, I didn't realize that I could. Um, so try to frame it positively instead of negatively. And the message needs to be internalized, which means it needs to be specific to me, which is what this example uh, demonstrates here, going from less personal to more personal. The third tool is what we call social diffusion. Um, and social diffusion kind of tends to flow from social norming. Social diffusion is this idea of that behaviors, because we tend to act like people that we're around, um, the quicker we can move that behavior through the population, the more likely it is that a large percentage of the population will start to adopt it. And the magic number is usually around 15% of the population. 
once 15% of the population starts engaging this behavior, it's kind of like a domino effect and that it will move much quicker through the rest of it. Um, typically what we have to do uh, is, uh, the, kind of the, the biggest thing here is using personal sources of information. And we know examples like of this through our, our daily lives, right? Do you tend to try new restaurants based on friend suggestions or an online suggestion? Well, perhaps both, but you might assign a bit more weight towards the suggestion of your friend. Um, there have actually been really great examples of this, uh, of using something like, like an all-star personality to spread the message. So, you know, professional athletic teams might find an athlete who is really engaged in the community that a lot of people respect, and that person can become the spokesperson on whatever the topic may be, and that's found to be really impactful and that it helps the information diffuse through society quickly because it's somebody that a lot of folks might admire. Uh, so you might, you might pick all-star uh, folks on your campus or in your organization or in your community to, to speak to folks uh, to get them to, or to influence them to change their behavior. Also with social diffusion, typically the more visible and durable it is, it's more likely to spread. Um, versus um, something that's maybe a bit more hidden and maybe virtual or um, maybe like a commercial, if it kind of like is durable, like it lives physically, it tends to be a bit more, uh, a bit more impactful. But again, we just got to try to get to that 15% threshold. How do we spread information or behavior examples through this population to that 15% to then allow the domino effect to continue? The next one is prompts. Um, we use this a lot in the sustainability field. Um, really a prompt, the goal of it is just to combat something that all of us deal with, and that's the fact that we're all busy and we might forget, right? A prompt is a moment of recentering. Just to, hey, just remember, remember to do this, um, kind of just brings you back towards the moment. Um, typically a prompt is a visual or an auditory aid. It doesn't always necessarily have to be that, but that's usually how it manifests itself. And it reminds us to carry out a, an activity that we, we might actually have forgotten. Um, one thing that, that is important about prompts is that they really only work if the person is already predisposed to that behavior. Meaning, if I don't know what is or what isn't recyclable, a sign on the bin isn't gonna prompt me to do it because I'm still missing that information. So prompts really have to be paired with some of these other tools to be completely effective. On their own, it assumes that people have a baseline level of understanding or it's a behavior they're already predisposed to. To be effective, prompts have to be noticeable, self-explanatory. They also have to be presented at the time or the space of the behavior. So oftentimes you might see on a light switch, hey, remember to turn me off before you leave the room, right? It's right around the faceplate to the light. Um, it again is framed positively rather than negatively, right? So we're encouraging beneficial behaviors and almost always is paired with another tool, again, because a prompt is there to just remind us of something that we're, we're already predisposed to. The next one is communication. Um, how we communicate behaviors, the method by which we choose to communicate it is really, really important. Um, there's been quite a bit of research done into um, you know, what types of communication people respond the most to. Um, and the three words that repeatedly come up in the literature are vivid, right? So something you're gonna remember, uh, concrete, right? Something that is real to you and also personal, right? You can attach your person, you can see yourself, you can see your life in that messaging. Um, if that information is vivid, it is more likely to be encoded. And encoded means that you're actually gonna remember it. So we all might have those favorite commercials we had either as a kid or even now, and for some reason it just gets stuck in our head. Think about why did it do that? It was encoded in your mind, why? Um, it may have been really funny, it may have been outlandish, it may have pulled at your heartstrings, right? But somehow it was encoded. We have to mimic that kind of style when we communicate that we want people to change their behavior to be more sustainable. Uh, when we frame our messages, again, if we're getting back to some of the financial or the personal benefit stuff, uh, they have found that frame, or stating your losses is actually a bit more impactful than the savings. So if you don't do this, here's what you stand to lose versus if you do this, here's what you stand to gain. Um, probably because we're maybe a bit more sensitive to money leaving our pocket than we are money coming into our pocket. Also be careful uh, with threatening messages. So um, 
I know we have to walk the line with that when we talk about climate change. We understand the severity of the problem, but we can't be all doom and gloom, right? If we're doom and gloom, we're gonna create a hopeless society where folks don't feel empowered to do anything. And there are actually two different coping mechanisms that psychologists have found, and what we wanna do is avoid one, but encourage the other. Um, the emo emotion-focused coping says that, listen, this is just too overwhelming for me. I emotionally cannot handle it, and I'm just gonna ignore it, right? I, I just can't do it. Um, we have to be really careful to stay away from that. The one that we want to encourage is the problem focused coping where, hey, I understand this is an issue. I understand the severity of it, but you know what? I feel empowered enough to take direct action to fix it. So um, at least for us uh, in, in our office, like my rules, like, listen, we can communicate about the severity of climate change and all these issues that are happening, but we're always going to pair it with a way that people can help fix it or the way that people can get involved because we don't want to leave people feeling hopeless. And then also modeling sustainable behavior can be really important in your communication strategy to where if it's a visual strategy, actually show yourself or whoever is in your video or whatever it is doing the behavior that you want people to emulate. Um, if you just say it without doing it, then you're leaving it up to people's imagination to figure out what you want them to do versus if you actually show them the behavior, they can, again, it's encoded, right? They can call back to say, oh yeah, I remember when so-and-so did that in that video and now I know how to do it. Um, so we try to always try to model sustainable behavior. The next one is incentive. And this is a pretty big one in uh, getting folks to act sustainably. Uh, an incentive, uh, carrot of the stick, right? How do we encourage people to perform actions more effectively or to even begin an activity, right? We can use incentives for both of those. Um, incentives, they can be financial. It can be recognition of some sort. It could be brand exposure. Uh, incentives mean different things to different people. So again, we go back to identifying those barriers and those benefits. We want to understand what are the benefits that people uh, want, right? That's the incentive that we want to create for folks. As we're developing incentives, there are certain things that we need to consider. Uh, one is the incentive size. Uh, so again, I said there's, there's tons of papers out there on recycling. Um, there have been studies done like Let's say you were to ticket somebody for putting an incorrect item in a bin. Well, how much does that ticket need to be? What's the appropriate size of that ticket to actually get people to change their behavior? Is it 25 cents? Uh, probably not. Is it $5? That might do it. Is it $50? Well, that might be overkill, right? So figure out like where on that threshold is the sweet spot where it's just enough of a pain or just enough of a good thing to get people to do what you want them to do but not too far on either end where they don't care or they perceive you as, you know, trying to run their life or something or really impacting your quality of life. Pair the incentive with the behavior, right? So if you want people to, uh, to recycle more, that's where like a, a bottle return policy, right? You bring the bottle back, you're going to get 10 cents, right? We have paired that incentive with the behavior that we want. It needs to be visible and hopefully something that people know about, right? So the communication strategy around your incentive matters. You want to reward the positive behavior, typically. Um, so especially in sustainability, we tend to be more the carrot than the stick. Um, although some folks have gone to the stick and it, it can be impactful, but it creates a, a little bit of uh, disgruntledness right around the issue, which maybe you want to try to avoid. Another thing is um, when you think about incentives, you also need to answer the question, how long is this incentive going to be around? Are you developing this incentive to be there forever? Is it only going to be there for the first six months, for the first year? Because if you remove an incentive, either too quickly or at all, you may find that people default back to the normal behavior because the incentive was the only thing getting them to do it. So be thoughtful about the length of time of your incentive um, and also if and when you remove it, what percentage of your population is probably going to just fall back to business as usual. And just to know that sometimes it doesn't matter how good or bad your incentive is, there's always gonna be a subset of the population that just won't care, right? They, uh, they either will ignore them or just have no interest in them, right? So don't necessarily let that particular subset of the group's behavior that you're trying to change dictate your strategy for incentive. There are always gonna be people that no matter what, they're not gonna do anything, right? That's not, that's not who you're building this strategy for. You're building this strategy for, you know, the 60% of the population in the middle that could go either way, right? Those are the folks that you want to encourage to change. All right, 
And then the last one, which is probably the hallmark of uh, tools when we think from a psychological standpoint to get people to act the way we want is convenience. Um, it doesn't matter to a large extent how great those other six tools are if you, that you have put together. If the behavior that you're trying to encourage is still inconvenient, people largely won't do it. Um, so I know when we talk about sustainability strategies here, our rule of thumb is, hey, it has got to be as easy, if not easier than the status quo. And if it's not either of those two, we're gonna have trouble. So sometimes that means making the behavior that we want easy, but also there's the flip side of that where we make the behavior that's the status quo harder. So then it looks like the behavior that's sustainable is easy. Um, an example of this is um, here at IEPY, we have a desk side recycling program where uh, every faculty and staff member gets a desk side recycle bin that's, you know, I think it's three and a half gallons and then a little trash can that sits on the side. Uh, it, it used to be that custodial staff would only pick up the trash and you had to empty the recycling yourself. Now we flip that model to where custodial staff only empties the recycling and you have to take out the trash yourself. So we have made recycling more convenient by increasing the barrier or, or the, how much of a pain it is to take out your own trash. Um, so you can, you can do those two different ways, or you can make the behavior you want more convenient, or you can make the behavior that you don't want less convenient. So the goal really for the sustainable behavior that you want is, again, you identify those barriers and you just try to reduce them, if not eliminate them to the best of your ability. And, and that may not always be possible, for the behavior that you're trying to encourage, which then means you need to go to the flip side, like I mentioned, to the behavior you want to discourage and make that one a little bit tougher. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a slide here with some additional resources. Then I wanna open it up to, to questions from the group. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes here, which I'm hopeful you'll have some questions and we can walk through maybe even some problems that you might have and we can brainstorm ways that we could use these seven tools to get around them. Um, so if this was interesting to you, and again, this was the quick and dirty version of this. I usually take two whole classes to cover it for the course that I teach. Uh, I would encourage you to look up these resources. So the original Fostering Sustainable Behavior book by uh, Dr. Doug McKenzie Moore, who's the psychologist who wrote it. Again, that book is available for free online if you go to the cbsm.com website and create a free account or you can buy it. It's a really great book. Um, it, I think it's a book that should be in the back pocket of every sustainability professional because it, it really should be guiding uh, or a guiding uh, tool for how, how we do our work. If the book is too much for you to take in because it's a pretty hefty piece of material, I also provided uh, two other resources that are much, sort, much shorter. Uh, so a primer in CBSM, which again is community-based social marketing, uh, Utah State University actually created this Instead of a really long book, I think it's only about 20 pages, right? So you can go through some of these case studies where you can read a little bit more, but maybe you don't have time to digest the whole book. And then if you really don't have time, uh, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, their Office of Sustainability put together a quick guide to CBSM and it's like two pages. Um, so you can have this just kind of hanging up in your office and flip back to that whenever you need to uh, double check your gut on uh, what you're thinking. And uh, when we follow up with this event, uh, or with this webinar, not only will we send the recording, but we, I can also send links to these materials so you don't have to go search for them yourself. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna end it here and let you all, we'll kind of like open up the floor for questions. Uh, my contact information here is on the slide. Please, please, please always reach out to us, to myself, to Christina, to Deb, to any member of our team. Um, we're always willing to help you all. A win for any of us is a win for all of us. We all have a lot of uh, life, it's life sustainability experience under our belt, so we are, are certainly more than happy uh, to help you uh, kind of get through any of these behavior change issues. And it's likely we're all having the same ones. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out. So I'm gonna turn the screen off real quick and then we'll go back to gallery view. Here we go. And then if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat box or you can also unmute yourself and uh, kind of talk to the rest of the group. It looks like, all right. Does anyone have any questions? You can, like I said, you can drop them in the chat or we can chat amongst ourselves.
was this even just a little bit helpful? <laughs> I see a couple of head nods. That makes me feel so much better. Super helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Social interaction is so weird on this platform. Okay, okay, we've got some questions coming through here. So let's let's start with Miranda here. Miranda says, what's your favorite success story of using this method for IUPUI? Uh, okay, so I, I guess I have a, an actual project, but then, um, so the project would probably be the best, the desk side recycling one, just because it was such a clear way to switch conveniences. Um, now that's not to say that people weren't 100% happy about it, right? Now, whenever you change anything, people are gonna be upset. But because we were able to go through these seven step processes, make sure we understood the barriers and benefits, the typical amount of complaining that you, we may have received was significantly re re reduced because of that. Um, I will say another one is, I, I remember being in a meeting with um, parking and transportation where we were talking about alternative transportation. And I actually drew that chart up on the board of the behavior that you wanna encourage, discourage, and then the arrows with the behavior and the benefits. And they were like, oh my gosh. Like, and they all like just feverishly wrote this down. Like, this is what we need to be doing in parking and transportation to get people uh, just to start taking alternative transportation more often. So there's, there's a success story of what we were able to accomplish with it, but then there's also this, the success story of other people seeing the value in it as well. Um, and, and hopefully adopting that for, for how they start to think about challenges that, that they wanna uh, try to overcome. All right, let's see. Uh, Nancy had a question. Anyone had, an, had success in altering bus routes that are not convenient for their community? So we can crowdsource this one. Um, I will say like being a large state institution, it's a bit easier for us to make requests to alter bu bus routes, <laughs> but not everyone else has that sort of, uh, has that sort of leverage in the community. Um, if, if you're in Indianapolis, I, I found Indigo to be, to be pretty accommodating, um, especially if they can find a way to maybe like take two stops that maybe have lower usage and combine them into one that maybe is at a better location for other folks. Um, on campus, we also have our own shuttle on campus, and I know that they are, we are continually looking at what's the best placement for those shuttle stops based on where people want to go and need to go. Um, and that's always a work in progress and always seems to be being edited by someone in order to, to better serve our campus community. Um, but without knowing exactly where you're from, Nancy, it's a bit, I guess my best, my best uh, effort or my best suggestion would always be to reach out to somebody, right? Uh, you, you, you can never really know unless you ask and, and try to explain your reasoning and even maybe think about like, what are, the, what are the bus company's barriers and benefits and how might you encourage or discourage certain things there, right? You, you, can, use this, you can use this magic against them too, right? So. <laughs> Okay, here's, here's the one from Dylan. Of course, Dylan's gonna have, okay. On the flip side, what was something that you thought would work that did not? Ooh, buddy. How long you got? <laughs> no. um, so I think, I, I guess I won't have a specific project, but I, I will say that there's a specific hurdle that, uh, happen, that can happen repeatedly. And that's if you don't have access to the individuals who are making decisions, it's very hard to understand what barriers and benefits they are perceiving. So without that one-on-one -on -one conversation with your decision makers about, well, why, why is this suggestion a hurdle to you? Uh, it's hard for you to develop a strategy that might overcome that for the decision maker, right? Because you're trying to change the behavior at the level of the individual, but somebody higher up the chain of command has to make the call to say, yes, go ahead and do that. So you also have to understand what's going on in their head, the decision maker, and their barriers and benefits may be completely different than the ones that you're trying to solve for your user. Um, so that's not necessarily project specific, but I found that can be an issue, uh, especially like in a big system, uh, like, like, a, like a university. Um, so that's why it's really important that you have good relationships with your decision makers and you understand like their values and where they come from so you can avoid those. Otherwise, you create this fantastic strategy and come to find out, you know, somebody doesn't like it. All right, somebody says, um, 
Oh, yeah, there are, there are a couple comments here about public transportation. Um, I got a private one that said, um, how would you encourage folks to reduce meat consumption? So I might open this up to the group. Um, what do you all think? Like, let's think about our seven tool, or first of all, let's think about our, our berries and our benefits, right, to, to meat consumption. And this can just be really quick, right? We don't have all the time in the world. But what are maybe some, some benefit, or let's start with what are maybe some barriers to people not eating meat? Anyone have ideas? And you, can, you should be able to unmute yourselves, I think. Bueller? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe their family doesn't understand or makes fun of them. Right, so that's social norming, right? The idea that the people that we're close to might look down on a behavior that we're trying to adopt. All right, that, that's a really big one. Could be a change of life, lifestyle. You need to know how to use the produce like vegetables and other ingredients to make it taste just as good as say a meat product or someone is usually used to. Right, your lived experience, right? what you have. There, there may also be some, uh, I know oftentimes there are perceived financial hurdles around switching to a more plant-based diet, um, especially, uh, yep, Emma, yep, just saw your comment come through. Yeah, so uh, whether whether that is real or not, right, Some there is there is at least a, there's some sort of thinking in a lot of people that a plant-based diet is more expensive, whether that is real or not, kind of varies based on your local market. Um, can't find meatless restaurants at option, or meatless options at restaurants, right? If you're trying to go vegan or vegetarian, it's gonna be not convenient for you to go out to eat, or maybe you're gonna be always eating off the salad menu. And that's not fun to always eat off the salad menu. Concerns about not getting enough protein, right? So these are all, right, these are fantastic. Um, Concerned about added costs to lifestyle, yep, or ability to get, pro, get enough protein. So these are all things that we know people have issues with, which means if we're gonna, we can't just go out there and tell people, oh, adopt a plant-based diet without adequately addressing all of these barriers um, and creating a strategy around that. All right, Hillary had a question here. Have you seen an overall decrease in energy usage on campus since you started the energy challenge? So yes, yeah, we have. Um, so during the three week period, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now. Let me see if I can pull them up. So uh, we started the, the energy challenge in uh, 2018 and then fall of 2019 was the second year. So we'll be gearing up for fall of 2020 being the third year. Um, and we have always seen savings over those three week period, over the three week period. Um, and typically what we do is we try to pair buildings that compete against each other that have the same or similar energy profile. So it's not like unfair competition, um, but the building's actually competing against its, its prior self, its historical self as a percentage of reduction. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's actually been um, upwards of 30,000 kilowatt hours, um, which is a lot, way more than a, than a house uses in a year, that's for sure. Um, so there are also some financial savings associated with that. Yeah, Amber, who ran it, says over 27,000 kilowatt hours in saving this year. Has the energy challenge competition resulted in any permanent change? Good question, Nancy. So that is a little bit hard to pick out because at the same time the energy challenge is happening, the campus is always actively investing in energy efficiency. So to kind of pull those two variables out from each other is a little bit hard. Um, I will say because, um, so I will say that our energy usage as a campus per square footage has been going down um, over time. And that trend will looks to be continuing based on our level of investment in energy efficiency, but it is a bit tough to pick out whether it was the challenge or an investment in a building that you know, may have driven a more permanent change. Okay, any other questions? We've got about five minutes here so we can do more questions or if you all wanna leave, you can do that. If people wanna hang out in the chat, we can um, hang out and chat as well. How did you juice, introduce the challenge to the campus? Um, so we actually have a couple, Amber, are you on the line? Do you wanna talk about? Amber's actually our energy intern uh, and she was the one who ran it last year. Amber, do you wanna unmute yourself and talk about how you, you put together an engagement campaign? Yeah, definitely. 
So for the uh, energy challenge, we kind of started out with our target populations, which we separated into auxiliary buildings and residence halls. So we kind of looked at our two target populations and built our campaigns around those. So for the residence halls, we worked on strategies of not taking as long of showers or turning off the light when you're not in the room, um, unplugging your electronics, where with the auxiliary buildings, we tried to focus more on, um, for example, strategies they could implement when just being there. So um, maybe not um, using hot water to wash your hands as opposed to cold water. Um, so really worked on like those two um, target populations. And then we created social media campaigns. Um, we put out flyers. Uh, we had a lot of club engagement on campus that also helped promote these events. And then at the start, we did a huge kickoff event to get people there to educate them, let them know what behaviors they could do to um, kind of participate and help advance this challenge. Uh, and then at the end, we did a big celebration party for the winning building. And there was a, another question, Amber, about incentives. Do you want to talk about the incentives that we used for the participants? Yeah. So for that, we had a few different competitions within the energy challenge. So the, the big prize is uh, if you are the winning building, you get a building party. So that um, building was the Tower Residence Hall this year. So they got a big party where we had food, music, um, different giveaways like reusable bags, reusable silverware. And then we also had a few minor competitions within where we gave away gift cards um, for the fresh produce market on campus and also some gift cards for engaging in the competition and signing up through the uh, Energy Challenge Reduction Pledge. And then the grand prize winner also gets, um, we have a banner that's hanging in Campus Center, which is like our student union building. And uh, every year the winning building gets their name added to that banner. It's like an NCAA style banner hanging from uh, the, the stairwell. Um, so it's kind of a, a kind of a public display uh, of who won. And then also just to kind of frame this up a, a bit broader, we're working to try to get the entirety of campus on board. We've just been doing subset of buildings to until we get comfortable with making sure we're accessing the, the data correctly. And the goal would be to have the entire campus competing. Uh, and then also IU Bloomington has an energy challenge. So hopefully it'll be the IU versus IUPUI energy challenge one day. So we'll actually have campuses uh, competing against each other once we standardize our processes. All right. Well, I think with that, I really appreciate you all attending. Um, like I said, we'll follow up with some more information. Appreciate you spending your time with us. And uh, please be well, spread a little kindness, and we'll see you all on the flip side of this. Have a good day.